Hello and welcome back to the seventh episode of the Neutral Zone Rewind. As you may know, I am Mitchell Porter, and today I'm joined by Caleb Newell from UWP. Hello, Caleb. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. We have a slew of tournaments to talk about that stretch from Dahlonega to Platteville. And before we get into the recap, I just want to say thank you for Terrence Checkett for filling in uh, the last couple episodes. Uh, this is a team effort. He's definitely been a team player. All right, well... Let's head up to the great state of Michigan with the Victory Cannon doubleheader. Starting off the recap here, we have the Victory Cannon doubleheader coming out of Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, the results were as follows. There were two matches, both between Western Michigan University and Central Michigan. Uh, the first game ended up being a 9-0 route over Central Michigan, with the following being a 7-0 route over Central Michigan. The Broncos continue a very hot st start to the beginning of the season with a doubleheader victory over the Chippewas. Uh, with these two results, the Broncos are now outscoring their opponents 26-7, to boasting a 4-1 and record uh, for the season so far. The Broncos are one of the bigger talking points of the season so far. Even though they have a great record with a uh, solid point differential, the only tough game that they've had to play thus far is against a young Miami team, which uh, resulted in a 3-2 to loss. If WMU wants to continue to move up into the upper echelon of the league, they need to prove themselves that they can play with the big boys of the league, the towns, your, your Grand Valleys, and your Cincinnati's. For the Chippewa, Central Michigan is a huge unknown, and the Michigan region is, this was their first bit of action this season. Um, we hope that they can continue to get back on their feet as a program. Um, essentially, COVID completely wiped them out. They were a former champion prior to COVID, so it's sad to see this dip, especially with the region as strong as Michigan is. Um, some key players for this tournament uh, for WMU were Chase Rosen and Brandon Basudely, or Basudle. I'm sorry if I butchered that. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that. And then for CMU, we have uh, Tegan Allen. I'm pretty sure it is Basudle, but once again, we apologize if we pronounce your names wrong. We're not linguists here. But... To go from the north part of the country down to the south, down in Dahlonega, we had a double header between a brand new team in Ole Miss and UNG. The two games that we saw were very entertaining if you were able to check in. UNG won both games, but they were very close. The first one was a 4-1 victory over the Rebels. And the second game uh, was a lot closer. It went to overtime. It was a 4-3 victory for the Nighthawk, uh, which is one of the coolest names in all of college sports, in one of my, in my opinion. But that game finished four to three in overtime with North Georgia getting the victory. North Georgia stays on their hot streak and improved to four and zero on the season, and seems to be brewing in the southern region. And you know maybe Northern Kentucky has to look out for this up and coming team, as it seems that their nationals experience last year in Athens has really helped them uh, improve hand over fist so far in the season. Although Ole Miss did not achieve the results they wanted uh, for from Spell, uh, they showed a lot of development overall for a team that just started only a few months ago. For key players, uh, we don't really have one for North Georgia. They have kind of been MIA, but we don't blame them. They're partying after their 4-0 start to the season. But for Ole Miss, uh, we want to shout out Landon Randolph for his crazy defensive performance on the day. Um, he was everywhere. He's like... I could not take my eyes off him. But we'll head back to the north part of the country. Let's send it back to UWP. Yeah, so kicking off uh, the weekend up in Platteville was a Pioneer Classic for this is the fourth installment of the Classic match here. Uh, this is the second year in a row where more than just UNL and UW Platteville has played, um, which is great to see because the central region is typically held up by both of those two teams. So we had six matches at um were sanctioned, um, and they'll go as follows. So UNL defeats UW-Platteville 5-1. to one. Illinois defeats Concordia 5-3. to three. UWP then defeated Illinois 6-1. to one. UNL defeats Concordia 8 to nothing. UNL defeated Illinois 7 to nothing, and UWP ended off the day beating Concordia 6-1. to one. Uh, Additionally, there were two exhibition matches um, with a mix of uh, NCDA alumni and some stout players. Um, they ended up beating the WP team 2-1, to one, and then UNL ended up defeating the alumni mix team 3-2. to two. Nebraska continues their reign as the king of the central region with a tournament record of 3-0 and 
five and zero on the season. Their toughest matchup of the day was against Platteville, uh, where they ended up routing the Pioneers five to one. Nebraska is looking more and more like they are reloading this year instead of rebuilding. They have yet to play anyone other than Platteville this season, so they are a huge unknown as to where they compare to the rest of the top talents in the league. If the Pioneers want to turn things around this season and compete with the best, they're going to have to patch up the fundamentals. And this is, you know, the simple beat of the drum with Platteville's story, the fundamentals killed them. After their loss to the Cornhuskers, the Pioneers did bounce back with dominant performances over the Fighting Illini and the Falcons, improving to 2-5 and five this year. The next game to closely watch, which I think was probably the most entertaining game of the weekend, was the Fighting Illini versus the Falcons. Um, I was truthfully surprised at the result. Um, the Fighting Illini ended up taking down the Falcons 5-3, um, to two, five to three, excuse me, sorry. Um, I thought the Falcons were actually going to take this match, personally, being that they had experience from last year and returners from last year. But a combination of regression, a lack of strategy, and the overall chaotic play style of fighting Illini led to a one notch in the win column for the Illini. Both teams realistically need to just play more dodgeball. They're both still incredibly young programs that have yet to really find an identity or a strategy. They have a lot of raw talent and just need to put the pieces together. Uh, the Falcons fall to 0-3 on the season, and the Fighting Illini are now 1-2. and Some key players that we'd love to shout out are Noah Wiley and Caleb Fowler out of UNL. Both of them have incredibly strong arms and are looking for a catch at any moment's notice. Free WP, we had the, both the captains, Caleb Locks and Thomas Zander. Um, Locks is kind of stepping into his own as a senior now, and Thomas Zander has been around the league for quite a while now and has a ton of experience in that shows. Um, for Concordia and Illinois, I have one for each. Um, we have Connor Knott, the heart and soul of the Falcons team. Um, he, they really look and depend on him to make throws and coordinate as they need. And for the Fighting Illini, we have Charles Cardenas, the, the founder of the club, just as Connor is for CUW. Um, he, again, doesn't have a lot of experience, but he is solid on his feet as well as a solid throw. Let's kick it on down to Miami. Yes, for our last tournament uh, to talk about today, we had the Red Hawk Classic, the second rendition of uh, the Miami University hosted tournament. And it started off with a bang. UC and VHSU went head to head, a back and forth match that saw the Bearcats get a two point victory, four to two in the end over the Falcons. Then, and probably one of the best games of the season, I know we, pro we say this every week, but I'm going to be honest, this is probably one of the best games of the season so far. The host, Miami Redhawks, beat Akron in overtime. And this is an Akron team that has looked dominant against other Ohio teams that are below them. And that is a huge win for the Redhawks, who have just completely defied expectations this year. You know, we thought that they were going to have a down year after they lost Ellie Ship for one of the best women we've seen in this league. But they have proved everybody in the league wrong as they continue to fight with the big boys. Next, the Bobcats got to winning ways over BGSU with a 5-1 victory. Cincinnati went 2-0 after their victory over Miami, 3-1. Akron then got some overtime revenge, but this time against the Bobcats of Ohio, 4-3. Then Cincinnati in, uh, routed the Zips 4-0, probably what was the match of the day coming into the tournament. A big win for the Bearcats as they went 3-0 on the day. The Red Hawks beat the Falcons in the Battle of the Birds 4 to 1 and to round out the day the Bobcats beat the Red Hawks 3 to 1 Ohio over Miami. Key players for each team let's start with Akron. Brad Fishbach saw the floor the most in his entire career in the tournament and he delivered so much for this Zips team. He was the last left alive more often than not and got clutch catches when they really needed him most. And along with uh, one of my dear friends, Jeremy Faircloth, he was all over the place as we saw him at the Buckeye opener as well. He's just had a great year so far, and Akron is really happy with his development. For BGSU, they wanted to shout out a few rookies, Colby Jeffries and Wes Nitzgorski. Once again, if I said that wrong, I apologize, Wes, but I think I did a good job. Uh, their rookies really showed out for BG, although they didn't get the results they wanted today. Their rookies really showed um, that they had the talent, especially Colby Jeffries, who was making his first ever appearance in the NCDA. 
So congratulations to him. For the undefeated Bearcats, Matt Rosinski, I mean, do we have anyone else that we have to talk about? He, he was once again called upon to be the workhorse of this Bearcats team, and he's just been one of the best players in the country so far. For Miami, they had a rookie of themselves, Davis Honroth. He had so many catches, including the overtime winning one, which was a very good catch for him. One, he won every ball that he went for, whether it be a rebound or off the rush, he just got everything. It seemed like he had a magnet, and he played a crucial role in defending for the team. And last but not least for the Ohio Bobcats, Terrence Checkett, obviously, All-American uh, first team probably this year. Um, one of the, uh, Another great tournament for him, and uh, Garrett Carbolito and Austin Benzman as well for the Bobcats. A great tournament so far a great year so far for the Ohio region. And um, we have a few tournaments to look forward this weekend. Caleb, you want to tell us about that? Yeah. So coming up this weekend, we have the Tyler Webb Memorial Tournament hosted by Bowling Green in memory of their late friend and teammate Tyler Webb. May he rest in peace. This tournament kicks off Saturday, November 18th at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Be sure to tune in on Ready to Stream and UC Dodgeball on YouTube. Uh, the following day, Bowling Green is hosting again for the women's tournament, and that starts at 9 a.m. You can watch it again on the NCDA YouTube, and the second court is yet to be determined. Um, be sure to check out the NCDA socials for any updates on that. Yes, and uh, to add on to that, the teams attending the Tyler Webb Memorial Tournament will be BGSU, the host, Michigan State, Northern Kentucky, Kent State, and University of Cincinnati. It will be a very look forward to turn, especially with Cincinnati and Michigan State on the schedule. Anyways, that will do it for the seventh episode of the Neutral Zone Rewind. Thank you for tuning in. My name's Mitchell Porter. I'm uh, here with Caleb Newell. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.